he still sits on the top of the on the top of the list. With the man who abducted Jessica Herringa killed by police two years after her disappearance, the same man's name keeps coming up. Now at 11, Brad Mason's violent past. Also tonight, a Target 8 investigation. A teen is thrown in jail for weeks after being wrongfully arrested. We got our hands on police recordings that show how it went wrong. And Storm Team 8 tracking some rain that's pushing our way through northern Illinois at the current time. Coming up, I'll tell you when we might see some rain tomorrow or who might see the most rain. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marley Ginter. I'm Brian Sterling. News 8 at 11 starts now. Live, this is 24 Hour News 8. More than two years after Jessica Herringa disappeared from a Norton Shores gas station, one name keeps popping up. Brad Mason. Police were arresting him for a brutal abduction and rape in Kalamazoo when they shot him to death last year. New tonight, Target 8 investigator Ken Kolker is uncovering that even in death, some persons of interest are more interesting than others. Ken? Yeah, Brian and Marley. Police in Kalamazoo and Norton Shores tell Target 8 they're intrigued by similarities between abductions committed by Brad Mason over the last decade and the disappearance of Jessica Herringa and by what he did with his cell phone the night she disappeared. Do you think the guy who did this to you is capable of that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I thought I was going to die for sure, 100% sure. It certainly seemed uh, like a definite possibility that, that uh, Brad Mason could have been responsible for Jessica Hearinga's uh, disappearance. It's a possibility, so, you know. Brad Mason's first known victim, along with a Kalamazoo detective, and even his own father think Mason could be more than just a person of interest. Police also point out Mason's connection to Muskegon, that he had been paroled to a halfway house a few miles down the highway from where Jessica was last seen. And maybe he was here that night and saw Jessica outside, um, and he took an opportunity. The first known opportunity he took, his first victim was here just outside Galesburg in May 2004, a 28-year-old woman returning home with groceries. I was going to get my baby out of the car seat and this guy just grabbed me and choked me unconscious and kidnapped me for a couple hours and drove me way out in the middle of nowhere. Into a field a few miles away where he raped her repeatedly. I was like, oh my gosh, he's gonna cut me into little pieces now. and. I didn't know what was going to happen. She says he acted as if he had done this before. Because he was like really weird about like wiping out all the fingerprints out of the hole inside of the truck. And he later cried, then dropped her off near her car where her baby was still sleeping. Kalamazoo Sheriff detectives identified Mason as a suspect early on, but Mason denied it. The victim couldn't identify him and he left no DNA. The truth is that it hurts because it's real. 11 years later, a 24-year-old woman was walking to her boyfriend's house near South Westnage in Kalamazoo early in the morning on February 5th, 2014, when she rebuffed a stranger's offer for a ride. Minutes later, he was back, punching her in the face, driving her away, choking her with his hands and with a strap, threatening to kill her. She was held for uh, several hours, uh, repeatedly sexually assaulted, um, tortured, uh, it was it was very brutal. It was the most violent uh, that I had ever seen in my career here. The rapist then dropped her off not far from where he had grabbed her. Kalamazoo detectives quickly zeroed in on Mason. Then they found that 2004 case from Galesburg. Once we had reviewed the 2004 Kalamazoo County case, we felt pretty confident that he was a serial uh, abductor rapist. Kalamazoo police were trying to arrest him two days after the Southwest Nids abduction when he came to the door with a realistic toy gun. Police shot him dead. Days later, Mason's father told police that his son had confessed that 2004 rape to him. When I asked him why he keeps doing it, you know, he said, because I'm slick, Dad, you know. He said, I think I'm smarter than they are. It was Kalamazoo detective Kristen Cole who later noticed the similarities between Mason's attacks and the Jessica Hearinga abduction. Both victims had uh, were, were petite white females. Um, both victims had glasses. Mason had punched his Kalamazoo victim in the face, causing her to bleed. 
Police found traces of Herringa's blood outside the gas station. Then there was the composite of the Herringa suspect. It looked to me like it could be a possibility that it was that it was Brad Mason. Norton Shore's detectives took it from there, but it went nowhere. They had hoped he had left a trail of credit card receipts, maybe even at the Exxon, but he used only cash. Searches turned up nothing at his Kalamazoo apartment. They hoped his phone had pinged on cell towers around Norton Shores the day Jessica disappeared, but he had turned off his phone at nine that night. He also did it those nights that he abducted those other women. The bottom line, no direct links to Jessica Hearinga, but no alibis either. That's a fear of mine. I'll say that, that'll be one fear that I'm, I'm hoping against, that um, if it is or somehow linked to him, that he took it to, he took it to his grave and only he knew where Jessica's at and only he knew what happened that night. It's, it's gonna, I'm hoping that doesn't work out that way. Now police say they have identified other persons of interest as well. They hope somebody who knew Mason will come forward with either a link to Jessica or with an alibi so they can move on with the case. Ken, the one lead that police in Norton Shores had with the hearing a case was surveillance video of that silver minivan. Any link? It, you know, right now they have not, you know, tied him with a silver minivan, but even his own father says he had access to a lot of different vehicles. I mean, he had been convicted of auto theft oh, in the wow. past, so he ran a, a chop shop at some point. So. Hmm. So you know, many knows? frustrations here because you know, only using cash, turning off his cell phone, right. just anything that police can grasp at, yep. he the, covered. Absolutely. Wow. All right. Ken Colker, thank you for that. Now, police are, though, still looking for tips about what happened to Jessica. You can call Silent Observer. There is a $26,000 reward. Also, right now on WoodTV.com, we have a complete timeline showing all of the key moments in the case. He was a 17-year-old boy running home for curfew when he wound up booked in the county jail and accused of taking part in a violent home invasion. Turns out he was innocent, but that didn't come out until he sat behind bars for three weeks. Tonight, we're getting a first-hand look at exactly what happened the night that he was arrested through the video and the sound from the scene captured on police recorders. Target 8's Leon Hendricks is live in studio control tonight with his story. Leon. Hey, Brian, good evening. How could it happen? It was a story that we found important enough that we fought through denials and appeals to finally get our hands on the video that show exactly what happened. Tonight's story starts here. Grand Rapids police stopping an SUV last August. The suspicion that this vehicle is connected to a violent home invasion on the west side. The victims bound and robbed in their home. Two perps on the run. Suspicion increases when police stop the SUV. One suspect bails. Police call out a description. Black male, black t-shirt, blue jeans. And then the other one speeds away. All right, it's fleeing. The car is fleeing. Police all over the area are now looking for the bad guys, one behind the wheel and the other on foot. A short time later, they come across Christopher Melton, a black male, black t-shirt, light colored bottoms, and he was running. They suspect he's their man, cuff him and detain him. In the same time frame, police also caught up with that SUV, suspect number two. Perhaps both perps are now in custody. To be sure, they brought the victim from the home invasion out to see each suspect to make sure they had the right guys. They call it a show-up identification. First stop was with the real perp, the one who sped away. Here's the voice of the victim. Her response then was immediate. Meanwhile, Melton is at another scene telling police what he was really up to. I was running because I was trying to get home before Police seemed to think his story was fishy. His time frames didn't line up, and there were changes as he repeated the tale. And then they brought the victim for a show up at the scene of Melton's arrest. I can't listen to the guy. How do I move more towards your light? How do you move this way? Yeah, that's him. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's him. Okay. 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 I noticed they were light colored shorts, and I knew that he had a black shirt on. While we now know Melton had nothing to do with the crime, the real man seen fleeing here was later caught. Still, eventually, that night, the victim says she is sure. So you are 100% sure that that is him? Yeah. Yeah. He's the one that takes it. I mean, I don't know if you have to get through the phone. Police give Melton the news. You hear that? Look, it's just He's booked and lodged for three weeks before authorities finally realized they had the wrong guy. Turns out his initial statement was the truth. 
Wrong place, wrong time. An officer's supposition early on. Later, the explanation for Melton's mistaken arrest. It's a horrible thing um, for anybody like this to happen, but it's a convergence of a lot of things. Uh, it was the wrong place, wrong time. The case now we spoke with Melton's family today. They tell us that he continues to do well in school, continues to be well behaved, and he has not had an interaction with police since. Now his mother tells us that the one thing she wanted for him out of this whole situation was an apology from the authorities who worked on this case. She says that has not happened. In studio control, Leon Hendricks, 24 hour news eight. Can't imagine what he's been thinking through this whole thing. Leon, thank you for that report. Switching gears now to your forecast after a nice day while well, showers are on the way. Storm teammate Chief Meteorologist Bill Steffen has an update for us. Bill? Yeah, it looks like tomorrow is going to be not only the coolest day of the week, but one of the wettest days we're going to see here in the next seven days. Let's take a look right now at Storm Track Live and look at all the rain that's off to the west of us. This is mostly light rain. You can see some pockets of heavier rain here. And we'll see as long as I got this tool up, we'll see if we can track that in. The earliest it would rain is about 5 a.m. around Benton Harbor, and the earliest it would be toward the Grand Rapids area would be around sunrise here. The leading edge of this has been weakening just a touch as it comes into the drier air. You can see a couple of showers over toward Flint. Those are mainly sprinkles moving away, but uh, most of this area is going to be moving in a direction about like that. So if you are south of Grand Rapids, much better chance of rain than let's say if you're north of Big Rapids. Uh, those areas may very well stay dry here during the day tomorrow. Temperatures, uh, well, we're down about three in the last hour here in Grand Rapids, down four in Battle Creek. I expect temperatures to bottom out in most areas in the mid-40s. It's already in the mid to upper 40s in some lakeshore areas, but winds are going to go around to the east overnight tonight. Temperatures ought to be pretty warm, uh, pretty uniform here during the day tomorrow, but cool day. Much of the day temperatures here will only be in the 50s. Coming up, we'll talk about our chances of rain and 80 degree temperatures for later this week. All right, thank you, Bill. It's the first of its kind on this side of the state, a tuition program for a public school. We broke the news last week that East Grand Rapids High School plans to charge tuition next year for a select group of students. Well, new tonight, after dodging our questions, 24 Hour News 8's Danny Carlson got a chance to speak with the superintendent on camera about the program. Danny. Brian, we first heard about this program because of flyers that went out to parents in several other districts in our area, like Forest Hills, advertising the tuition enrollment program at East Grand Rapids. You guys aren't just trying to get around schools of choice and get the best kids that you can? <laughs> No, <laughs> but I can see why people would think that. East Grand Rapids High School hasn't had a seat open for schools of choice in the past five years, but this new tuition enrollment program would create about 20 additional seats for incoming freshmen who are interested in pursuing the school's anticipated international baccalaureate program. Students will have to meet academic standards, even though after they are accepted as freshmen, they don't have to do the IB program their junior year if they don't want to. And while East GR's IB program won't be the first in our region, GRPS, for example, has had one for years, the tuition aspect is new, costing parents between two and three grand per kid per year, assuming whatever the district the student is coming from releases them to East GR. If the district the student wants to leave doesn't agree to that release, parents would be on the hook for 10 grand per year. There's always going to be bound to be people who say, Tuition at a public school seems like a contradiction in terms. Yep, and it, but it's, it's uh, in the school code, and we're not doing anything that isn't legal. Grand Rapids schools did send out a press release today touting their IB program, saying that they have 100 spots open next year, tuition-free. When we told East Grand Rapids superintendent that, she said that that's great, and it shows how many opportunities are available to Kent County students. All right, thank you, Danny. Well, are you ready to vote? The polls open at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. The focus is on Proposal 1, which would generate more than $1.2 billion a year for roads. Now, if the constitutional amendment passes, among other things, the state's 6% sales tax would increase to 7%. It would also eliminate the sales tax on motor fuels and change the current 19 cent gas tax to a wholesale tax. That wholesale tax would increase to around 42 cents starting in October. Now, on top of the $1.2 billion for roads, the Senate Fiscal Agency says the school aid fund would get about $300 million. Revenue sharing would get $100 million, and the general fund another $16 million. 
You can learn about everything Proposal 1 would do right now in the Decision 2015 section on woodtv.com. You'll also find details on other local proposals. Decision 2016 fever hit our state today. Retired physician Ben Carson announced his presidential candidacy in Detroit this morning. Republican Senator Rand Paul, who announced his candidacy last month, spoke at the Kent County GOP. And Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, who is considering a run, spoke in Lansing and in Metro Detroit. For more on what they said, check out woodtv.com. Coming up, a West Michigan neighborhood mourns after a four-year-old boy is killed in a house fire. Plus, a rapid bus driver and a high school student are now both in trouble with the law after a fight in Grand Rapids. We'll tell you what charges they're facing. And we continue to see rain moving in our direction from the southwest. Coming up, I'll show you when you can expect some rain and when you might see those 80-degree temperatures. Always tracking, always alerting. This is Storm Team 8. Well, Storm Track Live showing a couple of sprinkles east of Lansing over toward Flintport, uh, Huron over there. Not really not much going on. Here's the rain area coming in our direction. It's mainly rain. You can see a little bit of lightning in here, but not a lot. Our account here is only about 120, and that includes the stuff down here in Indiana. So as this comes our way, we'll see mainly just some showers and the possibility for some embedded lightning and thunder, but mostly it's just uh, kind of plain rain. And it is uh, going to be uh, really uh, hitting the area south of Grand Rapids more than off to the north. If you take a look at the north edge of this, it's really not making much progress. If you kind of extrapolate that, that uh, to the east like that, you can see where uh, Grand Rapids off to the south. We'll be seeing the bulk of the rain here. And we'll stop her and see if we can uh, track the leading edge of it again uh, toward Grand Rapids. Uh, that gets here uh, around or a little after sunrise and could be as early as about 5 a.m. down toward the Benton Harbor area. So early morning, probably just kind of cloudy in Grand Rapids. There's a chance uh, it could be raining by then, but most areas probably won't be seeing rain until after sunrise. And uh, 50 degrees here for a daybreak temperature, so a light jacket ought to do you. These are current temperatures. Uh, most areas down anywhere from 2 to 4 degrees within the past hour. Much of the day, it's only been in the 40s over by Lake Michigan, while inland areas made the mid-70s. We had a 30-degree temperature spread there for a while across the area. Winds turning around to the northeast now, and they'll be out of the east here during the day tomorrow. So here's what we're tracking. First of all, we should stay dry here overnight tonight. Good bet for some showers tomorrow, mainly from Grand Rapids off to the south. Could be a thunder shower in there and then warmer weather on the way after a cool day tomorrow. Wednesday afternoon well up into the 70s and then 80 here Thursday and Friday. Uh, as we approach daybreak, there could be some showers down toward the Indiana border. And as we uh, go on through the day, you can see this kind of develops right on up toward the Grand Rapids area and then uh, moves on out here for tomorrow night. So let's look at your eight day forecast. Temperatures here uh, coolest tomorrow at 62 will be in the 70s on Wednesday. Temperatures reach the low 80s Thursday and on Friday. We'll have at least a chance of a shower, thunder shower here isolated on Wednesday. Most of us stay dry and then a better chance of rain again Friday and Saturday. Maybe dodging a shower or two for the Riverbank Run and right. Tulip time. Oh, you'll still get those hardcore parade goers yeah. and runners out there though. Yeah, I've sure. run in the rain before. It isn't yeah. that bad. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not. Cools you off a little. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. Bear sightings in West Michigan. Up next, what the DNR says you should do to keep them out of your backyard. Tonight, investigators are trying to figure out what caused a fire that killed a four-year-old boy this morning. It happened at a house on North Bellwood Street. Four adults and four-year-old Charlie Compa were inside. Charlie did not make it out. Police say that his grandfather tried everything he could to save the boy, but told the cause of death was smoke inhalation. Police are expected to release surveillance video tomorrow of the fight that has a rapid bus driver and a high school student both facing charges. Police say the bus driver, 53-year-old Alicia Miller, will face a charge of misdemeanor assault and battery for last week's incident. The teen girl will face a misdemeanor charge of creating a disturbance. This cell phone video shows the end of the fight, but tomorrow we expect to get surveillance video from inside the bus. The driver has been suspended. Well, the bear sightings keep coming in north of Holland. These are the three we know of which have occurred over the past couple of weeks along the 31 corridor. And tonight we talk with a man who made one of those sightings. My guess is you had to be all of 300 pounds. 
walking around is four feet high when it gets on its hind legs, I would say it could stand all at eight feet tall. The DNR believes that everyone is seeing the same bear. It's likely here in search of food. The best advice to keep the bear away? Remove food sources from your yard like garbage or bird feeders. And if you see one, the DNR says, make noise to let the bear know you're there. Stand still and look big. I might need to stand on something to look big. You might big. want to run. Right. <laughs> or that, yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll stay right there. Casey Jones has Whitecaps highlights next in sports. As the Tigers took the day off before they close out a 10-game road stand with three in Chicago starting tomorrow, the Whitecaps hit the road for their own six-game stint away from Fifth Third Ballpark. First of three tonight in Lansing against the Lugnuts. Scoreless game here in the bottom in the top of the second. Caps, Francisco Contreras, chopper back up the middle. Look at the great grab here by Tim LaCastro. Gets Contreras at first, but it scores a run. Caps built a 2-0 lead, but the long ball unraveled it all. First in the fifth. DJ Davis, line drive, home run to right, gets out in a hurry. That was a two-run blast. Lugnuts up 5-2, and then the very next batter, Ryan McBroom, cleaning up on the other side of the field, back-to-back -back home runs for the Lugnuts. Caps made a comeback bid, but they fell short. They fall 7-6. The two will play again tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning. Well, it's a long drive from Detroit to Grand Rapids, and then back all in the same day, especially when the topic of discussion is a new contract. According to the Detroit Free Press, Wings general manager Ken Holland and head coach Mike Babcock, who made that same trip yesterday, had, quote, a nice talk. That, of course, about the contract. Holland saying he wants to make a decision on Babcock before the end of May. Babcock's contract expires June 30th. The Free Press also reporting that Holland will, quote, stew over what they talked about yesterday. And they'll talk again this week and hopefully come to some sort of conclusion on that contract. There'll be a lot of drive time, though, for the two because Ken Holland said yesterday both he and Babcock would be back to scout the Griffins and the young talent for both home games Wednesday and Friday. Those, those will be the opening two games of the second round of the Calder Cup playoffs against the Rockford Icehogs. Best of seven series now with the Griffins holding home ice advantage. They won out over Rockford by a single point in the final game of the year to win the Midwest Division. Two divisional rivals very well matched. Games three, four, and five will be in Rockford and game six if necessary back in Grand Rapids. Elsewhere on the ice, NHL playoffs, Capitals and Rangers series tied a game apiece. Scoreless in the second, Washington's Jay Beagle following his shot, getting the rebound and banking it in. His hard work pays off there. It's the game winning goal. Capitals win it 1-0. They take a 2-1 series lead. All of a sudden, the top team in the NHL yeah. on the brink, down 2-1. Wow. All right. Thanks, Case. Bill's in next with one last look at your forecast. Well, we got a chance for showers tomorrow, especially from Grand Rapids to the south. A cooler day with a high of 62. Temperatures heat up after that. You're waiting for summer, 80s here by Thursday. Nice. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nice to drive with the windows down mm -hmm. finally. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.